Welcome friends to this special day, the birthday of my master, great master, I might say the greatest master, Azur Maharaj Baba Sahib Singh, who initiated me on 9th of March 1936. That was a long time back. Most of you were not born at that time. So it's a long time that I've had the pleasure of practicing what he taught, the path of the masters, Sansma, which enables a human being, while still in a human life, to achieve the highest goals, highest spiritual goals possible, namely to realize and be one with the ultimate creative force, which has been worshipped for people in different ways, in different religions, in different spiritual groups for centuries, that we are able to find that destination within a human life is a miracle. And he was performing miracles. He was able to show so many of his disciples what the ultimate destination of a spiritual seeker is. What is in fact our ultimate destination? Is it to go to heaven? And spend some time there? Is it to go to a higher level of awareness? Is it to find out what the Akashic records or the Akashic records are and to find out how destinies are made? Is it to see the creation of this entire universe from the universal mind in the causal plane? Or is it to discover our own true self? Our true self is beyond all these. Heavens cannot show us our true self nor can the causal regions where the universal mind operates and creates all the minds in this universe. Our soul is something very different. Our soul is the basis on which we get life. Our soul creates life, creates awareness, creates all activities which are going on around us. It creates all the universes. It also creates time and space and also creates, creates the mind. So a soul is far more powerful and far greater an identity of our own self than anything else that we have been seeking. Here was a human being, beautiful human being, you see his picture. He had such a beautiful white beard. Towards the end of his life, he was having a very beautiful beard and a very beautiful, graceful way of walking and talking. Apart from those great human features, he talked to us, and not from this level, but from all levels. He talked to us depending upon where we were. If we were at the physical level, he became ordinary physical person. If we were enlightened to some extent, he talked of that enlightenment. If yogis and masters, other masters came to him, he was able to have a conversation with them exactly on the level in which they were there. He was also able to identify how, where we all are in our spiritual quest, in our spiritual search. Such a wonderful man appeared in this world and what a great job he did. In the beginning, then he came as a young man. He worked for the military engineering service. He worked on roads, building the roads for the government and the military. One day while he was working there, his own master happened to come and point out to one of the ladies who was with his master, Baba Jamal Singh, that I have come for this man. And the lady said to Baba Jamal Singh, this man is working on the road. He has not even looked at you. How do you say you have come for this man? And Baba Jamal Singh said, wait for three days. When great master heard about his master arrival in that town where he was working, he went to attend his meetings. And during his discourses, he found the answers to all his questions that he had been wondering about for many years. He said, this is the place, this is the time. And this strange feature that when you meet a perfect living master like the great master, you suddenly get a feeling that this is what I was looking for. I did not know what I was looking for. 
I have found out now what I was looking for. And he's given the answer to those questions of mine. So that is a very revealing thing. As you associate more with these people, like the great master, you find their love for you is of a different quality altogether. Not ordinary love at all. This love touches your soul. Your mind sometimes doubts. Your mind sometimes rebels. Your mind doesn't accept. But the soul keeps on accepting. As you associate more, you begin to discover his love is unconditional. There is no judgment involved. He is not giving us his teaching or his love because we deserve it. If we deserve it, if we were to deserve it, none of us would get anything. Or if we look at our own lives, if we look at how our past is, look at the actions we have done, we don't deserve it. He does not judge whether you deserve or not. That judgment. He was completely free from judgment. What was bringing us to him was our seeking. Not our karma, not our actions, not our life but our seeking in our heart for the truth. Whoever has sought the truth in his heart, no matter what the karma is, finds a perfect living master. If you seek a heaven, you will meet a master who will take you to heaven. If you seek the universal mind, where the whole world is being created, he will take you there. Masters come to quench our thirst for our seeking of various kinds of spiritual achievements, spiritual realizations. But if you want to say, I don't want to have any of these. I want my true home to which I really belong, where I belong and where I have come from eventually, ultimately, then a perfect living master automatically comes into your life. You cannot find him. Nobody can find a perfect living master. You can find other teachers and masters. You can find masters who proclaim that they are masters. Perfect living masters don't say that. Perfect living masters live like ordinary human beings. And yet when you are ready for them, they appear in your life. That is why in India we say, when a chela is ready, a guru appears. When a disciple is ready, the master appears. It does not say, when you are ready, you will find a master. Because you can find other masters. You can find different kinds of teachers, spiritual teachers. Yogis, Swamis, Sadhus, all over, they identify themselves with the way they dress, with the way they talk, with the way they proclaim who they are. And that is why those teachers are all over. Great Master used to say, when I look at the Masters, perfectly Masters are very rare, but other Masters are perhaps more than the disciples. It's a big business. It's a very big business going on. But when you are ready for the ultimate truth, and it's all seeking in your heart, in your soul. It's not mental seeking. It's seeking in your heart. Something you are missing. You say, this is not my place. Then you feel you have had enough of this world. Enough of the pleasures, joys of this world. And the pains also with of this world. When you had all this ups and downs of a physical life. And life in other forms, of which you don't remember much. But we have lived many kinds of lives. When we realize we are done with it, we have had enough of it, then we seek inside our heart. At that time, a master appears. How does he appear? By coincidence, by chance, which looks like by accident. Many people say, I accidentally met the master. There is no accident. There is no accident in finding a spiritual teaching. It happens because of our seeking. When a person is ready, a master, perfectly a master appears. And that is why it's such a miracle that in a human life, tied down by these physical, sensory and mental systems around us, tied down by these three bodies almost around us, around the soul, the body of the physical material self, which we are all look at, looking at now, which we are living in now, the body of sensory perceptions inside, which is sometimes referred to as the astral body, 
and the body of thoughts, the mind, the causal body, these are like covers of all the soul. And with these three covers, we are completely hidden from our own self. The soul is hidden from our own self because we identify ourselves with these bodies. When we are in a physical form, we think we are a physical being. This is our self, the physical form. We don't realize the physical form has a very short existence. When we say our self, our soul is immortal, how can we describe our physical body as immortal? It's a very short life. Maybe 100 years, 80 years, 120 years. Nobody is going to live more than 135 years, according to some medical understanding today, that the maximum one can live is 135 years. If they change the entire being, the entire the change with transplant of organs and so on, they will extend the life. But it's a very short life compared to the cosmic time where we talk of billions of years. Here we say this very planet on which we live has a life of over 13 billion years. And how can we think that our short life is immortal? It is not. And if they save our internal self, our internal self, which has sense perceptions, more clear, definite sense perceptions than even the physical body has, which is, which is sometimes we can find it out by merely imagining things. If you close your eyes and imagine that you are flying somewhere, you are walking somewhere, it's pure imagination. Which body is that which imagines and goes about? What is the imaginary body? We say it's imaginary, just made up. But have you noticed that the made up body can see, can touch, can taste, can smell? How come that the imaginary body can do all the things which we say are sense perceptions of the physical body? Can we separate it? Can we separate an imaginary body from the physical body? If we did so, what would happen? Supposing we are unconscious of our physical body and we can still imagine our body, what would it be like? It will still be able to see, touch, taste and smell better than this physical body can be. We want to read and old age we are wearing glasses in order to read. Can you imagine when you imagine your eyes inside and read a newspaper, you can read very clearly without glasses. Can you imagine that the inner body, which you say imaginary right now, it does not remain imaginary if you are able to become unaware of the physical body. So why does it look imaginary? Because you are re relying on the physical self as the only reality. The only real self we are at this time experiencing is our physical body. Therefore, anything that is carrying sense perceptions is our imaginary body. If we become unconscious, unaware of our physical body, the imaginary body becomes a real body. It looks like the physical body was merely imaginary. What is shifting that you can make a real thing into unreal and unreal thing into real is your attention. We have placed our attention completely scattered in the physical body right now and through the physical body with the help of sense perceptions inside the physical body created from the imaginary body, the astral body and the mind, the thinking mind, we are able to create experience of the whole physical world. We think the physical world has to exist in order for us to have a physical experience. That is not true. If this was necessary, you could never have a dream of a physical reality and a physical entity you have every day. You go and have dreams and you see things the same way as physical. Sometimes you see more than physical in dreams which you cannot see in the physical wakeful state. These three bodies are us. It's not one. Three bodies. And we are thinking the physical body is the only reality because our entire attention is the physical body. If you pull your attention from the physical body, pull your attention to where you are operating from as a conscious entity, where you are generating 
the experience of awareness, which if you were to study carefully in the physical body, you are operating from the head, from the brain, from behind the eyes. That particular point behind the eyes is very important. It appears that we are stretching out our imagination, stretching out our awareness from that point and by placing our entire attention on one form of ourself, we make that form the only reality. That's what's happening right now. Can we pull back our attention? Yes, that's the purpose of meditation. True meditation is not meditating upon something. It's meditating upon your own self. Most of us don't do that. We are meditating. All of us are meditating. That means thinking about. What are we thinking about? Other things. External things which have been received by us, by our sense perceptions, and we are not thinking about ourselves. If we, if we begin to think of ourselves other than the physical body, what happens? If you think of nothing else but what is happening behind your eyes, when the eyes are closed, what's going on there? You see pictures in front of you. You see a lot of pictures of the physical world. And then you begin to see experiences which are not physical. I do these experiments in so many of my meditation workshops where I tell people, imagine these flowers sitting there. And they imagine, try to imagine the flowers that they have seen. And they begin to see flowers which are emitting light and emitting colors. They, aren't, they do not exist in the physical world. I ask them to imagine other things that they imagine and see things they never see in the physical world. Which means there is something else also besides the experience of the physical world which can be actually perceived through sense perceptions by withdrawing our attention to our own self. Not placing our attention anywhere, but withdrawing it to our own self from where attention is originating, from where it's coming out, which is our true self. Right in the physical body, that particular point in the human physiology, the particular point is right behind and between the eyes, right between the ears. It's in the center of the head, the most protected area in the physical body. And therefore, sometimes we call it the center of consciousness. And since we see with these two eyes, and these two eyes don't see the same thing, just by the difference of their location, one sees one picture, the other is a different picture. That's the reason why 3D movies can be made, where they place two pictures on the screen, one seen with one eye, one seen with the other eye. When we see them together, they merge and become three-dimensional and look like things are moving actually towards us. We create three dimensions. We create three dimensions in a movie. We are creating the same three dimensions now by using the three eyes and merging and combining them. Where are we combining them? We are not seeing two pictures. We have two eyes, but we are seeing one picture. And we create a distance. Yes. And we create distance by using both eyes together. Where does the merger take place? If you carefully examine, if that your eyes are looking, where are you merging the two images? You'll find it's exactly in the center of the head. And therefore, that point has sometimes been called the third eye. We perceive sense through two eyes and actually see from the third eye at all times, even now. Some people are searching for third eye. You don't have to search. You are seeing from the third eye even now. By combining two images of, this, of the two eyes, you are combining and seeing even now from the third eye. Therefore, we know exactly where the attention is coming out from. That's where the third eye is. So that's in the center of the head. How does it help us to know this? It helps us because that way it becomes easy to withdraw our attention to a point that we already know. That's why it's much easier to be able to withdraw attention to a third eye center. We close these eyes and we use another gift given to us called imagination, which is what talking about. And we imagine we are in the center of the head 
third eye center. What happens when we try to imagine that we are there, that we are imagining our head. Now we are behind these eyes. We are pushing back. Now we can feel the ears are on either side. What will happen if we do that? And whoever has done that has found so much new light, new world appearing. It doesn't have to appear here. Imagine how close this is to us. Imagine how easy it is for us. Why are we making it so difficult? Meditation is very difficult, very hard. Why? Because we do not pull our attention from outside. And why does that happen? Because even when we meditate and want to meditate on the third eye center, we are meditating on the world. And who helps us to meditate on the world and not allow us to stay there? Our own thinking mind. Our mind has stored so much information about the outside world. When we try to go there, the mind thinks of other things, which it takes as more real than anything inside. And that is why the thoughts of the mind, they draw us out. We have to control that part if you really want to see the result of what who you are inside, if not this body. Which is the internal body that is carrying sense perceptions and functions for a longer period than this body will. This body has a short life. That body which is having sense perceptions has a much longer life. When we say we believe in a past life, it looks like past life was something else in a different body. The sense perceptions were still the same. The astral body was still the same. And we don't even remember that. If we can pull our attention sufficiently to become unaware of the physical body, we will be able to concentrate and stay there and even remember things. We will then switch from a physical function of the mind into an astral function, sensory function of the mind. And the mind will begin to remember things we have seen a few hundred years ago, thousand years ago. It looked like it was our life. The same self had the same experience. Some people go through past life regressions and they can remember things. It's only by concentrating the retention within that you can remember those things. So we have an inner body which carries out sense perceptions. When it is used in conjunction with the physical body, it's limited to a small period of time. When you use it without the physical body, it's a much longer period of time. Normal life in physical terms of an astral life, astral body, is 1,000 to 3,000 physical years. This body comes, can come several times during that period carrying the same astral body. Supposing we are able to withdraw our attention from the astral body, process is the same, no difference. The astral body also feels it's got eyes to see, ears to hear. They are not physical. There are no matter molecules involved, but the sense is the same. Just like you imagine, you are walking here, that, that imagination will carry a body it's just like this one. It will not be material. It's just made up of your imagination, your thought. Similarly, the inner body is made up of sense perceptions and has the same mind, the same thought that you are having in the physical body. So then the two can operate together. The thinking mind, which still thinks the same way and which carries some burden. And that burden is sometimes called the burden of karma. Karma means the actions we have performed in past lives, which are created by the mind, stored in the mind, and worked out in the mind. The law of karma does not operate, operate in the physical body or the sense perceptions. It operates only in the mind. When you think of doing something, you create a karma. When you carry, a, carry it out, it enhances the karma. If you do something which your mind says is very good and believes it, you get a reward for it. If you do something which the mind says, I should not be doing, but I'm tempted to do it because of some pleasure involved, then that, if your mind is saying it's negative, it's bad, evil, you get punished for it. That's the whole law operating in our three lives, physical, astral, and causal. The law of karma operates in all these three, and it creates a storehouse, Store big storage of our actions and intentions that are all stored and then they play out to create more lives for us. 
So this is the basis of having these experiences based on cause and effect. Now those are all held there. And when you don't have the, uh, the experience of a physical body, you still have experience of the same karmas in the astral body. And if you withdraw your attention in the head, behind the eyes of the astral body, the same process to withdraw your attention, become unaware of the sense perceptions, you open up another body, which is your mind. It's called the causal body. The mind and causal body are the same thing. It's a thinking mechanism. It thinks, rationalizes, makes sense of things, and it performs various functions. All the functions the mind performs are in time and space. It cannot function outside of time and space. It needs time for the smallest thought. It needs time to make sense of things. Nothing can happen in the mind without time. Why am I emphasizing this? Because our soul, which is hidden by the mind, does not need time. Our soul is doing things right here. It does not need time at all. What kind of things is it doing? Our soul, not the mind. Intuitive knowledge, intuition, gut feeling, suddenly knowing something. I know it. How do you know it? I don't know how I know it, but I know it. That kind of knowledge is coming from the soul, not from the mind. The mind has to think in order to gain anything, any knowledge or any experience of knowledge, whereas the knowledge of the soul is spontaneous. What is the biggest function of the, of the soul, different from the mind? The experience of love. The experience of love is not time-based. It just happens. When the mind thinks about it, then it puts it into time frame Sometimes enjoying it, sometimes not sure of it, sometimes in doubt of it, and sometimes destroying it. But the mind is only a thinking process on top of the experience of the soul, the spiritual experience of love, any love, the spiritual experience. But when we want to put it down into physical terms in a physical body, it can become lust, it can become attachment, it can become attachment to people in graduations. It can become many forms, but the true love of the soul, which is spiritual, comes without time. It occurs immediately, with no sense of time. It's not a thought. You cannot think yourself into that kind of experience. So, appreciation of beauty. We look at flowers, beautiful. We don't analyze and say, why are they beautiful? We open the window and see, how a beautiful day. Does it take time? Instant. Appreciation of beauty, the experience of love, and the experience of intuitive knowledge, they are all functions of the soul. And they are taking place here, they are taking place in the three other regions, including our spiritual region, and they continue forever. That is why we are right now using all the system in us. We are using our soul for these functions, using our mind for thinking, rationalizing, we are using our sense perceptions to divide perception into separate seeing, touching, tasting, hearing. And we are using the physical body as our entity in a physical world. We are using a combination of all this at all times. But to find the reality, we have to go within our own self. Because these are covers outside of ourselves, around us. And we have to withdraw attention inside to be able to find who we are. And that becomes simple because the timing allowed to us, the time allowed to us to do this is limited in the physical world, is much greater in the astral world, and is in millions of years when we come to the mind. The age of the mind in physical years is millions of years. Same mind, same karma, same storage, same problems, same sanskars go on for millions of years. And we are using the bodies of sense perceptions and the physical body over and over again to play out those karma which are stored for a long time. It's amazing how long it will take for us if we really were to play off, pay off all the karma. Supposing a master came and said, I am ready to take you back home. 
<clears throat> but you owe to this physical world and the astral world and the causal world a payoff from your previous stored karma. You could be here a billion lives and not go back. Imagine what the power of a perfect living master like great master Baba Sawal Singh was. He had the power to accept a seeker and take responsibility to take him back to his true home in the very same life by first burning or erasing completely our stored karma, what they call sinchit karma, at a time which he called initiation. Initiation was merely acceptance. Acceptance, okay, I accept you and I will take you to your true home. When a master says that, when a perfect living master says, I accept you, I will take you back to your true home, where is he speaking from? We hear his voice from the human body. Where is he telling us from? From our true home. What's the difference between us seekers, even enlightened seekers? When we get enlightened, our enlightenment depends upon shifting our attention from one self to another. Shifting our consciousness from one level, physical to astral. When we astral level, we don't know the physical. When we go to causal, we don't know physical or astral. When we find the soul, we know the soul is our truth. But not these were all illusions. We cannot function at all levels at the same time. But a perfect living master functions at all levels at all times. When he talks to us, he is talking from any level that is required for him to communicate what we want to know. When he accepts us and initiates us, he is talking from the true home, beyond the mind. And therefore, his promise is not being made because he once went to the true home and now can take you. His promise is because he is speaking right from our destination. It may surprise you that he is talking to us from the true home and we are also at the same time in our true home but our attention is not there. His game is not to carry us anywhere. His game was to take our awareness back to where it belongs. Actually, the truth is we never left our true home. This is a matter that bothered me a lot and when I was very young. I was explained that the spiritual path consists of a ocean of consciousness, which is our true home. And the drops of that ocean are souls. And some of us, unfortunately, left the ocean, thinking we'll have an adventure somewhere. And we moved far away. We came into the world of mind, world of maya, world of the, of the physical level, and got lost. Now the spiritual path says, Work hard for your spiritual journey to go back. That the drop should go back with struggle and merge in the ocean. As a young seeker, I was very bothered by this. I said, I am a drop. Beautiful drop. Sun shines on me, I make a rainbow color. I delight in my I have identity. And they are telling me, work hard to do what? To go back and merge in an ocean, ocean will not care one more drop coming in and I will lose everything I have. What kind of spiritual path is this? It did not appeal to me at all. But this description itself was not correct. The truth is that we were never separated from the ocean. We lost the awareness of the ocean. We just forgot who we were and within the ocean we are the drops. And the spiritual path is not going anywhere. Spiritual path is to awaken to our own reality by discovering we were the ocean all the time. Only for the sake of a certain experience, we became drops. This cup contains water and they are all drops of water. What's the size of those drops? They're so small or bigger. What makes them small? What makes them bigger? If I want to see the drops, I will imagine they are drops of water. How big are the drops? I can make them very big. I can make them very small. What I am using is my awareness. 
This is the truth. We have contracted our awareness in the ocean to have a different experience, which we call physical, a slightly larger experience we call astral, still larger we call causal, and eventually we are the ocean. And they were separate. This made sense that the spiritual path is not an ocean which is waiting for a drop to come back and a drop losing everything and merging in an ocean. That the ocean was the drop. And that realization was created through a spiritual journey. We call it journey because in this physical world, when we are in one location and the location changes to another, we think we have journeyed there. And that is why we call it a journey, a spiritual journey. The spiritual journey is merely awakening our sense to our own reality that we were always the ocean. It's not a merger in that sense at all. It's, it's a realization of our truth, of who we really are. And what do we find? No matter how separated we look here, no matter how many souls there may be at every level of consciousness, including the spiritual levels, no matter how many they are, they are all within the one consciousness. And the discovery of the one consciousness in which all levels have existed is our ultimate destination. When you discover that, you find you are everything and everybody. Somebody asked me, when you go to your true home, that can you look back upon the people who are here? And I gave a strange answer, surprised him. No, when you go back, you carry the whole creation with you. Because the whole creation is there. Everything has been created, including this physical experience, over there. Not outside of it. There is nothing outside of totality of consciousness, which is our truth and our true home. Imagine this is possible by meeting a person like great master Baba Saavn Singh, who spoke to us from the realization of the ocean and made his disciples into the same ocean like himself. Sometimes they say there is a philosopher's stone which when you touch steel with it or iron with it, it becomes gold. But they say perfect living masters are not like that philosopher's stone. When they touch you, the philosopher's stone touches you, they make you into philosopher's stone. When a perfect living master, totality of consciousness, accepts us and says, I accept you and I will take you back to your true home, he is going to make you identical to himself. And even if you are physical here, sitting as a human being, your awareness will be the same as of the master. They don't promise you to be better people. There are thousands of other people telling us how to be better people. There are millions of books written on how to be better people. They don't come for that. They are not teachers at all. They have come to take the soul back to totality. When the soul and the mind and the body say we are ready and we have done enough. The question is, if that is such a beautiful, wonderful place where we belong in one totality, why are we here? Why should we come here then? What brought, brought us to be individuated, separated human beings here, if that is our reality? What made us blind, blind ourselves to our own reality? The reason was very simple. The reason was that consciousness, totality of consciousness, as I explained, is love, beauty, total knowledge, total awareness. It's not the experience of love, not the experience of knowledge, not the experience of beauty. It is love. How do you experience it? To create as an experience. So the totality of consciousness becomes experiencer of what itself is. As an experiencer of itself, it separates and creates what it looks like an experience for an experiencer. And that's the creation of this world. Every level is based upon that principle. That if you are something and you want to experience something, you have to become an experiencer of that. And that creates a separation of some sort. It can be a very close separation almost no separation, which means you are the one and the many at the same time. 
which is in our true home, that's the situation. Or you can further separate to get this experience from a, what looks like a distant place. When you come away from that, you discover that the experiences that you can create in a created universe are based on pairs of opposites. Right here, all the experiences we are having in the physical world are based upon pairs of opposites. It's a world of duality, day and night. Here we are seeing light. Supposing we don't have these lights, but the light is a natural, natural phenomenon. Supposing we saw light of a certain order, day and night, whether we close our eyes or open our eyes, we see that light. I mean, nobody would have ever seen light. The word light would not have appeared. There was no way to know it. The darkness made the light possible as an experience. We say happiness, if somebody never had unhappiness, there is no such term as happiness. Everything we are experiencing here is based upon pair of opposites. In science too, they have accepted. If there is no anti-matter, there can't be matter even. If there is no positron, there will be no electrons. Every sphere we find that this experience we are having is based upon pairs of opposites. And in our true home, there is no opposite. How do we have the experience of truth? By creating an opposite. That's a non-dual world. We create a world of duality and create an artificial opposite to our non-dual world. These are philosophical concepts, but they explain the reason why it was necessary to have a different experience to the same consciousness. A separation. Experience of love through separation. If you're not separate, how can you experience? That is why this experience was generated for consciousness to be conscious of. When we call the ultimate self as totality of consciousness, we are not saying totality of power or something. We are saying there is an inherent awareness involved in that. And that is why we have got all this creation here. The good justification for experiences of consciousness to take place and the more we multiply the variety of experiences, the more we multiply the duality of this universe, the more we appreciate our non-duality. Sometimes we try to describe things that are beyond the mind. We can't describe. Nobody can. The mind has very limited power to describe anything that is out of time or space. Our truth is not in time and space. Therefore, there is no description possible. Nobody has been able to describe it. Therefore, to give a reference to it, we all make stories. Mystics have come and made stories. Said Siddhyal Singh Ji, Swami Ji of Agra, who started the Radha Swami faith, he tells about the highest regions in his discourses. They are tall trees growing there, several miles high. And they are laden with diamonds and rubies. There is no time to have time or space to have trees there. But why is he saying that? To show it's a very good, attractive place. It's something to go, go to. And why did he use you? rubies and diamonds? I believe because most of his audience were women. <laughs> Natural jewelries. But the point is... Here we describe the ocean. There is no ocean there. We have no language at all to describe what it is. All our descriptions end at the causal plane. And there is no way we can describe anything beyond it. But still, we try to tell stories, to make it attractive, to make it say there is something which is your own self. And more than the mind. The mind is merely a body. It's not yourself. Distinguish between the soul and the mind distinguish their functions are different. Mind thinks, soul does not think. Mind speaks in thoughts, soul does not speak. Mind does not listen, soul listens. Our listening capacity is a spiritual capacity. Our speaking capacity is a mental capacity. And we are using both all the time. We want to listen and speak but we speak more than we listen. 
If we listen more, we will become more spiritual. Meditation, they say, can be done in many ways. First step, repetition of mantras. Most people meditating are using certain holy words to repeat them and say that we are meditating. If repetition of words is meditation, it will take you nowhere. If you listen to what you are repeating, it will take you somewhere. Even words given to us to repeat are only effective when you listen to what you are repeating. If you don't listen, it's parrot like your mind will be talking and listening to other thoughts where you can keep on speaking any word you like. People have done it. They are repeating the words are being spoken by the tongue and the mind is running all over the world. Therefore, that's no meditation at all. And we can spend a whole lifetime doing that. If you start listening, what will happen? Supposing you repeat any words in your mind with your eyes closed and listen to what you're repeating, you start listening to many other things that are happening there, including various sounds that occur inside. Even a slight concentration of our attention behind the eyes begins to reveal there are other sounds besides what we are repeating. And if you can shift from repetition of words which are being generated by your mind to listening to what is not being generated by your mind, the music inside, you go deeper into meditation and have a successful meditation. People don't do that. They think the repetition of words is the meditation. Not at all. Listening to the words. And if the words relate to something that we experience outside, they won't take you anywhere. Because the thought will be associated with the object which you are repeating. Supposing I were to repeat cup of water as my mantra. Cup of water, cup of water, I can say a billion times and not move even one inch inside. Because all the time, the cup of water that I've seen outside will be in my mind. But if the words we repeat are not related to any object outside, and if possible, they are related to a possible experience inside, then you listen to them, then your mind is not distracted and in fact is pulled inwards. That is why so many masters, they tell us to repeat words which don't have any meaning outside but have a lot of meaning inside. As you begin to have inner experiences, you begin to relate those words to those experiences. And that helps in pulling your attention inside. The whole game is of pulling your attention inside and withdrawing your awareness of the body. First step. Second step. Again, listening to sound which have already appeared, the next level, listening inten intently at the third eye center of the inner body and becoming unaware of sense perceptions and opening up the world of your mind and having a different experience of time itself. <laughs> Imagine we are sitting in this physical world. How is time being experienced by us? Time seems to flow only in one direction. By the way, this has bothered scientists a lot in the last few years. Because since Einstein declared, the great scientist Einstein declared, that time-space is one unit. That time and space go together. Time is merely an ordinate of space. And therefore, you cannot talk of time separately from space. The concept has grown that time-space is one unit. With one big problem. In space, I can move there and come back. In time, I can't go back and come here. Why should there be this distinction? If it's the same thing. If time and space are the same, in space I can go forward and backward. Why can't I go forward and backward in time? The truth is, in the astral plane, we can freeze time. In the causal plane, we can go forward and backward. These are actual experiences which are being taught, thought about by scientists without knowing where they are coming from. But if you have an actual experience by withdrawal of attention and see those things, you will see time here does not stop. It seems to be a continuous flow. And time can be stopped any place in the astral plane. You like a vision, 
you like a spectacle, hold it. You can hold it. When we were little children, we used to play a game called freeze. We were running around, somebody would say freeze, we had to stand exactly in the same position where we were. Till we unfreeze, then we could move. It looked like a game. In the astral plane, it's a reality. It can be done this time. In the causal plane, we can move backwards and forwards at will. That means past lives don't look like past lives there. They look like events placed and we can see those events or we can see events of the future. Time is totally different. So is the sky different. Here, the sky is dark. The sun makes it bright. Stars and moon make it bright. The light has to emit from somewhere to make this world light, light it up. In the astral plane, there is a twilight zone. There is a grey kind of light all the time, 24-7. When you imagine things with your eyes shut, you can shut your eyes completely. And you can imagine things, in what light do you see that? There is a continuous light in the astral self, in the, even the higher imaginary self. And there is a golden light in the causal plane. If you have seen a sun setting, and you can see it, you can't see it when it's high up with these eyes, but when it's setting, you can see the beautiful golden sun. Supposing you stretch that sun to the whole sky, that's the causal sky. You can experience it. Everything shines golden under that. The spiritual sky is not in space and time, but people have tried to describe it. That if the sun shining at midnight will just stretch out over the whole sky, that will be the light of that spiritual stage where the soul discovers itself. So this light and sound, they all vary. The sound which looks like sound to start with becomes a power, creative power. And then becomes a personality with a soul in it. And the same sound becomes ourselves at the end. So these are wonderful experiences that all lie within ourselves, all of us, no exception. This is not a special gift given by the Creator to only a few people. This gift has been given to every human being, no matter what country, what nationality, what culture, what age, what color of the skin they have, we all have the same thing. Very universal message that we all have this system in, in us, so long as we are human beings. The qualification to have all this and the ability to discover all this is granted because we are human beings. To be a human being is the greatest gift we could have ever had. And if we use this gift of a human life, we can find anything we want. Or we can apply it to outside inventions, outside discoveries, make great things outside from the same areas. Same areas of consciousness. They work inward and outward. So it's a, it's a beautiful gift we have. When we are ready for this, ready for the ultimate, the perfect living master appears in your life. Your mind may not accept it. Your soul will accept it. Your mind may argue. Soul never argues. Your mind may have doubts. It's supposed to have doubts. The mind has been created with very specific functions built into it. Apart from the functions, mechanical functions of thinking. Thinking, remembering, storing things and so on, storing even karma. It also has the function of creating doubt. And leading to doubt, creating fear. Doubt and fear are a function of the mind. Why have they been embedded with this function? The mind has been fun functioning like that because if we don't have a doubt, we'll be so gullible. Anybody says something, we'll accept it. We'll have no chance to find out how much is acceptable or not, how much is real or not real. So the element of skepticism or doubt is a good element. It's good as a screening. But sometimes we overuse this and we doubt everything. And every time an experience comes, we doubt even our experiences. People have told me of their inner experiences, which they had totally convincing. They said, we have unshakable faith. And then some tragedy takes place in their, in their life. And the shake it, and the faith is lost. So mind can create that. 
But the soul does not do that. When soul is seeking, it never stops seeking. It will keep on seeking till it finds. And that is why I can say very confidently, if you are seeking something, you will find it. Whether you find it the next day or next life is different. The time factor is different depending upon the intensity of your seeking. But if you are seeking the ultimate, you will also definitely be found by a perfect living master. So that is the beauty of it. That the mind creates a screen, helpful screen for us to screen as best as we can. But you can't keep on screening all your life. Some people do that. Great master used to tell the story of a professor. They use the word professor just to say intellectual person. A great thinking intellectual person. He went to a village. And in the village, he did not know there were wells at the same level as the ground with no parapet walls around it. So while the professor was walking, he fell into the well. And this, fortunately, the water was not very deep. So he didn't drown. But he said, how did I fall into the well? I should have known better. And while he was moaning and groaning about being in the well, a villager came and heard him and said, wait, wait, you have fallen into the well. I will go bring a rope and pull you out. The professor said, before you go, first tell me how I fell in the well. Also tell me, how can I believe that you will bring a rope? Thirdly, supposing you bring a rope, how will I know that halfway when you are pulling me out, you will not drop me again? Answer all my questions before you go and bring the rope. He said, the villager said, wouldn't it be nice if I pulled you out and then we could answer all these questions? No, I will not let you come go anywhere till you first answer all my questions. He said, then you stay in the well. <laughs> do you know we do that sometimes? We want all questions to be answered and keep on questioning all our life and then we die and come back again to ask more questions. There is a place for questioning. There is a time for questioning. But there is a limit to how much you question. I am personally very fond of this story because when I was young I used to ask a lot of questions. I used to say Master, if you are real, then you should show me something outside. For example, I have to catch a train today. I am running late. If the train is late, I will know you did something. I went, train was late. I said, Master, I think you did something. Next day, another opportunity. 10, 12 times I tested my Master. And then I went to see Master that, yes, you are proving yourself to be Master. He said, will I keep on proving or will you move forward also? <laughs> Simple question. You can ask questions all your life and do nothing more. There is a time when we feel this is enough. It's worthwhile now taking the next step. Okay, if the next step is not there, I can move back. But to say, no, I will first ask all my intellectual questions sitting here and no matter what, till I get all the answers, I will not take one step towards meditation is no good. Because when we ask intellectual questions, we get into a little rough weather also. Because questions arise more questions. And there are some things that the mind cannot understand at all. There was a group of philosophers, professors and barristers came from England to see Great Master. And they talked to Great Master. They said, Master, you're teaching something and you ask us to believe them, we don't want to believe like that. We have to understand it, what you are teaching. And it makes sense to us. We are all educated, highly educated people. We have trained our minds to accept everything. We can understand anything. And you say mind cannot understand some things. Give an example of something that the mind cannot understand. And the great master said, do you believe in God? Yes, we do. Do you believe in one God or many Gods? One God. Okay, you are seven of you sitting here in front of me. Do you believe God is inside you? Yes, we also believe that. That if God was not inside us, He is the power that gives us life. And therefore, we believe God is within. Our religious text, the Bible says so. 
or the text says so that the kingdom of God is within us. So we believe God. You are seven people. Are there seven gods or one? Did you divide the God amongst yourselves or is he whole? If your mind can answer that, I'll be very happy to hear. They could not answer that. There's one God, never separated, <laughs> never broken a piece, and is inside each one of us complete. How can the mind understand? He's not a piece of piece of God sitting inside us, the whole of it. The whole God, only one God sitting in each of us. How can the mind explain? That's when they stopped arguing. They said, we understand there is a limitation to how far the mind can go. Even the questioning of the mind has limits. It cannot go beyond that. And that is why at a certain point, the seeking becomes strong. It says, okay, let me take one step and see by meditation. Do I see what is explained at the next step? If yes, I'll take the second step. That's worthwhile. This is not blind faith. Great master said there is no scope for blind faith in spirituality. And all religions require blind faith. Big difference between religion and spirituality. Religions say this is what it is, now believe it. No explanation what you should do to verify all that. Just accept it. If you don't accept it, you are doing something very wrong. Committing sin. A big deficiency. This is not what the founder of the religion said. They said something different. This is how the religion is practiced. The founder said the same thing. That go within and verify yourself. Now spirituality says, go within and find out. And when you are ready, you will get help. Help right outside in the physical world. Who is going to help us inside if we don't want to go alone? They say there's a danger in going alone. Because in the astral place there are heavens and hells. We out of curiosity might land up in a hell. In fact, one of the initiated BPs in good old, good old days, in great master days, actually went into hell. In meditation. And had to be called back by great master. So, if we want to go guided by somebody, who can guide us inside, alone? Our own true master. Our own true master is never outside, always inside. Who guides us inside is a master who appears inside and guides us. We don't see him because our attention is all out. Therefore, when we say we meet a human being who is a perfect living master, we are not really talking of a human being. We are talking of our own true master inside, appearing outside as a human being. And how long does that last that we should think he is an outside master? Only till we find the inner master inside. Then we discover that was merely a reflection of our own inner master who guides us. The inner form of the master we sometimes call the radiant form of the master. And it's that master who is with you continuously guiding right the, the whole journey of spirituality. So this is outside because we don't see inside. The outside master only appears in our life because we don't see inside. And he guides us to what point? So we can see him inside. And he is a reflection outside of the inner master. Imagine if we say this whole world is illusion. Maya. Created. Not real. How can an outside master be more real? It's just part of the same thing. It's also illusion, also created. Then where is the real master? Inside. And the outside master's big responsibility is to take us to the inner master in which we see him in the same form as we see him in the outside. To be sure, that is the same person we talked about. And then of course forms can change continuously. Our form, master's form, changes. These are the best possible way this arrangement has been made for us souls who claim to be lost souls have left our true home and not found it again to go back to our true home. An arrangement so beautifully made. Who made it? We ourselves. In our totality, this whole arrangement was made at the inception of all creation. 
that we made the arrangement. When we have had all these experiences, we should be able to go back. Who chose our destinies? How did we become who we are? Why are we so different from everybody else? What made us be born in a certain place, rich or poor, in different places, different languages, different nations? Who decided that we should be like that? Ourselves. When did we decide that? When we decided to pick up a destiny at the causal plane. From the Akashic records, we picked up. Nobody else. We picked up a destiny. Why did we pick up a destiny which we are regretting today? We could have been very rich and kings and all that. Why did we pick up a destiny in which we are poor? Because we knew it's just a dream-like experience we are going to. It's like watching a movie. The only difference between watching a movie in the theatre is there we are sitting in an audience. The show is on the screen. Here we are sitting in the head of one of the characters of the movie. That's why it looks like we are very close. There's no other difference. We picked up. What made us pick up the current type of life? We have had many lives. What made us pick up this one? Because in this one, we found out after we have had these experiences so far, we can go back home. Very big thing. We didn't care what the other events were or what role we played. We can play any role. It doesn't matter. But this was part of our destiny. At a certain time when we are ready to leave, we can. And at that time, the perfect living master will appear in our life. And this is all prearranged. It's a wonderful thing. Now you are all here because you are seekers. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. So I'm very happy to congratulate all of you that you are at the right place at the right time and your seeking is what will lead you to your true home. I'm very happy to celebrate the birthday of my master, Azur Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh, the picture you see here. He has given me everything I'm sharing with you. I have nothing of my own. Whatever I've shared with you, is entirely a gift from this man. So you can't imagine what I think of this man. The greatest. I have not met anybody greater than him. Nowhere. He is the greatest master. And I'm very happy you all joined me in celebrating his birthday and having a piece of cake too. They say you can't have the cake and eat it too. You did both. <laughs> Thank you very much for your patience.